everybody. Um, so my lab works at the intersection of robotics and wireless communication. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit of the opportunities and challenges at this intersection. So for this audience, there's no need to motivate and the idea of robots and unmanned vehicles becoming part of our society is not very futuristic anymore. Now on the communication side, um, we are being bombarded by radio frequency signals these days. We all want more and more connectivity and as a result of that, these signals such as Wi-Fi or LTE signals, like cellular signals, are everywhere. So what are the possibilities at this intersection? So, the first part of the talk, I'm going to take on uh, Henrik's challenge, or sorry, I'm going to take his challenge and we're going to talk about using communication signals, existing communication signals, such as Wi-Fi, to give new sensing capabilities to unmanned vehicles. So what can unmanned vehicles learn about their environment just by using, let's say, Wi-Fi signals? In the second part of the talk, then I'm going to use communication signals for communication, but to enable robust connectivity and flow of information in a team of unmanned vehicles. And then if time permits, I may say a little bit about our work on human-robot collaboration. So, so let's get started with the first part. Um, so this is the scenario that I'm interested in. So I have, let's say here, two um, ground vehicles that are moving outside of this area. They have no idea what's inside here. Um, they have, one has a Wi-Fi uh, router as a transfer, the other one has a Wi-Fi receiver, and they just want to use these Wi-Fi transmissions. So as they move around, one transmits, the other one receives. And um, they want to be able to image this area. They have never been here, they have no prior knowledge, and they want to just image everything with Wi-Fi. So, so when there is a Wi-Fi transmission or wireless transmission, it could be any wireless transmission, um, that goes um, through this area and it interacts with that area. So the materials in that area, they leave their signature on that signal. So what we want to do is just based on the received power measurement of that Wi-Fi part, which is what you can measure simply on your uh, Wi-Fi on your laptop, just reverse it and extract the information about the objects. Now, um, this is quite a challenging problem. And so the main question is how extractable is, is this information? And what is more important for us is what kind of motion patterns would allow me to image this area the best? What motion patterns would make this area more visible, basically? So, People have always been interested in X-ray vision. Um, people do it typically with big radar equipment, a lot of bandwidth, gigahertz bandwidth. Here we're just trying to do it with Wi-Fi. But because I'm using unmanned vehicles, I can optimize the positioning of unmanned vehicles and do have several transmit receive position and optimize them in a way that was not possible before to enable this with a simple Wi-Fi signal. So I'm not going to go through um, the details of the, uh, the, the theory um, behind it because I want to kind of talk about also other things and show some experimental results. But this is a basically a multidisciplinary problem. So on the robotic side, basically, um, it's about path planning that would enable imaging and understanding fundamentally what are the paths that are the best. On the communication side, uh, there's a need to come up with approximated wave modeling. That can, uh, that can model the interaction of this transmission with this area that are not too complex, like I don't want to uh, write Maxwell's equations, but they have to be informative enough for, for what I'm trying to do. Also, um, sparse signal processing is very important. That's also part of our proposed pipeline because this has become very underdetermined system. The number of measurements you would have as compared to the size of the area you're trying to image is very small. But like most things in life, while the volume of information seems huge, most information is collapsible to a much smaller space. So that's where we take advantage of a lot of sparse signal processing. And finally, we also take advantage of a lot of um, localized behavior through methods that uh, look like belief propagation and macro random field modeling of the whole field. So um, if you're interested more, certainly I'd be happy to talk about more details. I'm going to show you some imaging results. Um, these are real imaging results. I'm going to start with some um, 
2D imaging results. So by 2D, I mean the ground vehicles are interested in imaging a 2D slice of this area. So this is the area of interest. They have no information about it. As they're taking routes, the middle part is actually imaging the material property of the area. And the right uh, side, this is imaging if there is an object there or not. So you can see that as they take more routes, and they're going to take four routes, how the image quality is going to basically change. And when they're going to stop, we're going to look at it and compare what the image with the ground truth. So this is what they image after four rounds. So um, I could stop this here. Um, so this is the this is the ground truth to the image of that area, and this is what basically the image with just Wi-Fi signals. And basically, you can see that a lot. Of, obviously, we don't expect a perfect image, but a lot of details are pretty visible. And for instance, the center is image just um, three centimeter off what it was the true, um, uh, basically, distance. So, if I continue the video, and now it's stuck. Okay, so we do, this is the most difficult part of this work, is for students to build new um, areas. So, so we can uh, keep testing our method, we pay undergrads, uh, we give gifts, we give all sorts of things. And so the image, the, this other area, if I can pause it here, just you, you will see that um, there are these two blocks inside, they're imaged actually quite well. Now I made a mistake of, for instance, this wall, it kind of lumped it together here. And we don't expect perfect um, imaging, we're always keeping on improving it. But um, it's surprising how much information you can extract from these signals with, by using uh, unmanned vehicles. And so then my main PhD student goes in um, to, <laughs> and I don't know why he looks like he's at a gunshot, but, uh, <laughs> and so basically then he gets an image as well. And so more recently we, have, we were interested in doing this um, basically in 3D um, using um, copters. And that makes it um, a lot more challenging because now the volume of information is increased uh, drastically that, that is unknown and needs to be imaged. Also, localization and positioning is, is much more difficult for copters. So we use Tango projects, uh, Tango tablets to um, basically help them with the localization. And so I'm going to show you some of our, um, so this is the 3D, um, the copter setup. So I have uh, these um, air vehicles. There's one here, a little, little bit hard to see. Um, and it's quite well. Um, but anyway, back here is the ocean, and that's uh, uh, you know uh, that's a nice view in Santa Barbara. Just just want to point that out. Um, so <laughs> So yeah, so we have these, uh, these uh, copters basically moving around the area and we're interested in basically um, half lining the, and uh, imaging, uh, joint half lining and imaging uh, for them to enable imaging this area in 3D. So I'm going to show you um, a result. So this is, uh, this, is a, this is one of our results. So this is an area that was of interest to them and so they were moving outside of it. Um, they never came up, and actually, they, 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 to take a, um, a visual, uh, like a picture or anything, so they just used Wi-Fi. This is the ground truth of that area, the, the 3D binary ground truth of that area. And this is how they imaged it, just with Wi-Fi signals. And so you can see that a lot of the empty spaces and full spaces, they were imaged um, quite well. And like the middle part, um, the dimension, it, the, the, the top part is a bit thicker than what it should be, but at least it got the fact that the top of it is uh, thinner than the bottom part. And this distance, for instance, is just uh, image uh, two centimeter off than the original um, image. And this percentage measurement, so these are, this is less than 4% measurement, which means the number of measurements they took was less than 4% of the number of unknowns. So it was very underdetermined if, if it is not for all these additional things that we come up with to enable this. It would be very ambiguous to, uh, in general, to image this. Um, so um, just to point out, 
um, because I'm talking about uh, sensing with um, Wi-Fi signals, uh, we do also all sorts of other sensing with Wi-Fi signals. Um, we haven't um, optimized them uh, with um, using our MAN vehicles um, yet, but I just want to give you a sample. This is actually counting people um, with just Wi-Fi signals. Here, robots are just carrying the Wi-Fi cards, but um, people are walking. Oh. So people are walking in this area, and you can see that uh, the number of people and how basically they got counted. So this is the link counting the people, um, not by relying on people to carry any device, by, but by just how people are interacting with the link. And so this can go towards a lot of things like smart homes, uh, a home, your home network, figuring out basically um, where people are, which areas are more crowded or not, maybe turn on and off the cooler or heater, and so on. So we also have a lot of interest in general in sensing and learning about the environment with these kind of signals. Okay, so now I'm going to go um, uh, switch gears a little bit and go to now let's use the communication signals for communication um, and basically uh, to enable the connectivity of let's say T-Mobile unmanned vehicles. Um, so this is what I've been referring to as communication aware robotics basically. So let's say I have a team of unmanned vehicles, there's a search and rescue and you send them um, um, to help. And so they need to achieve their task in a, in a grouped manner and in with cooperation. So as a result, they need to maintain a form of connectivity. So as they move though, they will affect the link qualities. How can they best maintain the needed connectivity while achieving their task? So um, that's uh, the problem uh, we're interested in here. Um, so I'm going to also flip this problem and say the other way. So in the previous slide, I said the team of one man people need to achieve a task, and so it needs the connectivity. Now I can also think about using one man vehicles to just enable connectivity. For instance, can I use just a team of unmanned vehicles to form an ad hoc communication network where each one of them would position themselves and, and basically enable connectivity? Or in LTE systems like your cellular systems, can aerial vehicles or in general unmanned vehicles help extend the connectivity? Or let's say in my home where there are areas there's no connection, um, there's, I, I don't get the signal well. Um, there are routers that you can buy to extend your connectivity, but wouldn't it be better if, if they have mobility and they can figure out um, how to position themselves best to maximize the information flow in this house? So these are some of the uh, other possibilities um, where you can basically use mobility to enable connectivity. So, one, I'm just going to mention a couple of um, the um, challenges that need to be addressed for this. So, one of them is the learning of the link and prediction of them. So, um, in all these things that I mentioned, basically, for instance, let's say this, this unmanned vehicle that is here may, may say that, well, I need to go near this building for better sensing. But what would happen to my link quality if I go there? Can I even, can I even predict this? Is this even predictable? And so, um, traditionally, um, in robotics, people use these models for these predictions. So we say, if you're in a circle around me, we're perfectly connected. If you're outside of it, there's no connection. But we know wireless channels don't behave that way. This is a sample of a channel measurement um, that is made actually by, by unmanned vehicles. And so, um, so that, this model may not be a good model. So that leads us to the question of how predictable is the wireless channel. And so we've spent a lot of time understanding basically um, wireless channel predictability. And so here's the idea. So let's say you have a man vehicles or one on man vehicle or team come for an operation to, in a building. They may sample the channel a little bit on the trajectory as they move. Now, maybe their friends have uh, sampled that have operated in this area before or through crowdsourcing, there are some other samples of the channel available in this area. So let's say we use all these then what is the best prediction of the channel somewhere they haven't been? So they may say, okay, if I go there, based on all these things that I know from prior learning, what is my best assessment of the channel there? So we have developed a, um, the theoretical framework based on what we know probabilistically of how to model wireless channels. And so this is, for instance, one example of how they predict the channel. So this is, for instance, the true channel, and this is, for instance, how they predict it. And so, We've tested it a lot with using our robots to collect channel measurements to, to test this framework. So this framework gives them the best
best prediction, which sometimes it would be like, hey, I don't really know what is going on. So it gives them the uncertainty as well. So it gives them a PDF of the link quality somewhere they have not. Then uh, we can use that and incorporate it with navigation. For instance, here is a robotic router example. So I have a transmitter and receiver that are too far from each other. So we're using, let's say, a number of unmanned vehicles to um, basically optimize the flow of information and enable the communication. So the unmanned vehicles have to move around and find the best location that will optimize this flow of information. And so basically, and I'm not going to go through all the, all the theories, so the previous prediction framework now allows us to optimize the communication with the navigation under the resource constraint, like they don't, you don't want them to move too much, and there's some limited time cooperation. And so, so, so this, is a, this is a very simple um, task for that. Um, we had a, um, basically a transmitter here behind the post door and the receiver here, and a pioneer robot started here, wanted to figure out where it should stop to have the best flow of information by basically using the prediction um, of, of the link. So this is the end-to-end -end bit error rate, which is the communication quality, from the transmitter to receiver as it is basically uh, going towards the place and then it decides that this is the place it, it has to stop. This is basically by using the channel prediction and online learning and co-optimizing it with its path. Um, other thing I want to um, just briefly mention that one thing that will come up in these things is that a lot of times the parameters, like you can't just optimize the communication part separately and the navigation part separately. A lot of it is that you need to have a co-optimized um, framework basically where you look at communication and navigation parameters jointly because they affect each other. So if the area is uh, poor link quality, maybe the vehicle should move faster in that area. Maybe it should decrease communication rate in that area. So we've looked a lot, of, uh, a lot at these drone optimizations. I think the time is short, so I'm not going to um, say much about it. Maybe I'll just say briefly about, um, just um, briefly about the last thing um, that I just want to mention briefly about is the human robot collaboration. And so um, here, um, basically, I have a team of one man because we know that we want them to be autonomous, but we know that once in a while they may need help from humans. And so we do not want to have these annoying robots that keep bugging humans and for every question. And a lot of times humans may not be able to help. For instance, here we have a robot that came at a, an intersection on our campus. Its job was to find people in each side. And so we took images on four sides. And so basically, um, we can see that it can easily see itself that there is somebody here with its state-of-the-art vision uh, algorithm. It, it can say, okay, I know with high confidence this is the person here and this is the person here. But in these two sites, it cannot do well. It, it, does, it cannot find a human. Now for us, we can see the human here pretty well, whereas this is too dark and we cannot figure out what's going on here. So can this robot predict that I do not know what's going on here, but I don't think human will do as well. But and I, I don't know what's going on here, but I think human can help me. So, so we were basically interested in predicting the human visual performance. So this is another example. I don't need to um, go over that. But uh, so basically, we basically developed a pipeline to using deep neural networks to enable the robots to predict the human visual performance probabilistically, and then take that into co-optimizing it with its path line and sensing on the field. So it can say, oh, now I need to get closer to something to sense because I don't know what's going on and humans will not know. There's no information in what I gathered yet. I need to get closer. Or no, I don't know what's going on, but I can ask for a question. And so if we go back to this scenario that I showed before, basically now the robot um, using um, our, our basically method can now predict uh, well with a high accuracy that I need to ask uh, humans about question about this one, they can have them for sure. I need to get closer and get a better view of this one myself. So with that, I'm going to stop. Just want to acknowledge um, the students and the funding. Thank you very much.